Well, good morning. It's lovely to be with you today here in Tandrake and have the opportunity to come and to preach God's Word. Amen. Well, let's bow together, please, at the throne of heavenly grace in prayer. Let's all pray. Our gracious God and our loving and eternal Father in heaven, we thank Thee, Lord, once again for the privilege of meeting together on this Thy day in Thy house with Thy people gathered together around Thine own inspired, infallible, and inerrant Word. And how we thank Thee, Lord, that we can say with the psalmist, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we thank Thee, Lord, again for the privilege of coming together on this, the Lord's day, to meet with Thy people, to assemble ourselves together, to worship Thee, to give Thee the praise and the adoration uh, and the thanksgiving of hearts that have been redeemed by precious blood, those who have been born of Thy Holy Spirit, and we thank Thee, Lord, that we can say today that Thou hast met our every need, every need His hand supplying, every good in Him I say. Lord, we thank Thee today for Thy faithfulness to us. Lord, we realize that oftentimes we are unfaithful, but yet, Lord, Thou dost abide forever faithful. We thank Thee, Lord, for Thy saving grace and Thy keeping power. We thank Thee, Lord, for watching over us day by day. And we thank Thee, Lord, today for each one bowed now in Thy presence with a measure of health and strength and soundness of mind and of body. We thank Thee, Lord, for the privilege of meeting together as Thy people to worship Thee. And Lord, we thank Thee that even in these peculiar times and strange days in which we are living, how we thank Thee today that we can rejoice and say and sing like the old hymn writer that God is still on the throne and God will remember His own. And Lord, we thank Thee today that as we come to worship Thee, we thank Thee, Lord, for Thy grace. We thank Thee, Lord, for the peace of God and the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. And we just ask Thee today for those who are unable to be with us, Lord, through sickness or illness, Lord, that Thy hand would be upon them. We pray, Lord, for those who may be uh, watching online, that Thy hand would be upon them. And our Father, that they might know the blessing of God that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow thereto. Remember all who have been bereaved in recent times, and their hearts are still tender, Lord. We ask Thee, Lord, that Thou wouldst draw near unto them and Continue, O God, to give the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and give unto them beauty for ashes. And Lord, we pray that in these days in which we are living, we thank Thee, Lord, that the Word of God is not bound. And we thank Thee, Lord, for the opportunities that are given and presented to us to proclaim Thy precious Word. And we pray, O God, that as Thy Word would go forth, that it may be in the power and in the demonstration of God the Holy Ghost, that, Lord, we might know the anointing of the fresh oil of the Holy Spirit, even the enabling of Thy Spirit this morning to proclaim Thy Word. And we pray that it may be a blessing to every child of God. Lord, our cry would be, lift us up, Lord, lift us higher from the carnal mind set free. Fill us with refining fire, O oh God, grant us that perfect liberty. Lord, draw us after Thee today, we pray. We ask You, Lord, that as we would open Thy precious Word, that afresh even this day our hearts or minds may be centered upon our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we would pray that we might have a vision of Him, that we might be looking on to Jesus, the author, the finisher of the faith, and Lord, we thank Thee today that the Scripture reminds us that unto You, therefore, which believe, He is precious. And Lord, we pray that even this morning as we would read Thy precious Word and hear its truth, that the Lord Jesus Christ may become even more precious to us. 
Lord, we may be able to say, oh, Lord, I know I love thee better, Lord, than any earthly joy. Lord, fill our, our minds and our hearts and our whole experience this morning, even with a vision of our Savior, what He has done for us at the place called Calvary, what He has accomplished for us and purchasing for us through His precious shed blood, through that sinless life that was laid down upon the cross of Calvary, that He has purchased for us eternal redemption. And Lord, we realize that eternity itself will be too short to sing Thy praise for all Thou hast done for us. Lord, be with us now as we wait on in Thy presence. And we ask Thee, Lord, for every one of our sister congregations today at home and abroad, that Thy gracious hand would be upon them. Remember all Thy servants who are laboring for Thee on the mission field today. Keep Thy hand upon them. Give them health and strength. Protect them, Lord. Preserve them. Meet their needs. Watch over them, we pray. And our Father, give them fruit for their labor. And Lord, we do pray that You'll bless Your Word as it goes forth today. And not only in our own denomination, but every place that's true to the blood and true to the book, we pray, Lord, that at the end of this day, it may be on high day in the worship of God, that precious souls may be saved, that backsliders will be restored, and that God's people will be blessed and built up on their most holy faith. Lord, be with us. Bless this land of ours, we pray. O oh God, how we, we need a, a moving of Thy Holy Spirit, how we need a, a quickening, how we need, Lord, the, that the Lord should work amongst us, Lord. We pray that God's people, that we might be enabled, to, that we might be broken, that we might come and uh, weep before the altar of God, that, that we might uh, come before Thee and, and, and cry unto Thee and turn from our wicked ways, that we might look to our God, that Thou wast here in heaven and heal the land. Lord, be with us now as we wait on in Thy presence, for we ask all these things in the Savior's name and for God's eternal glory. Amen. Well, as I said, it's nice to be with you today uh, here in Tandragee to have the opportunity to come and to minister God's Word. At this stage, I'm going to ask our brother, Mr. Lavelle McElrath, if he would come and make to us the necessary announcements, please. Well, on behalf of our ministering session, we give you a very warm welcome along to church this morning. Good to see you. Uh, the holidays are kind of over, if we had any holidays. Uh, this summer is all a bit strange, so it's good to see the church at capacity, what we can take, and there's a good number in the church hall, so we appreciate you coming out. Uh, we realize we're in difficult circumstances, all the ongoing situation with COVID-19, so we really appreciate you coming out to church uh, this morning. Uh, please remember uh, the risks still posed by COVID-19, and particularly this area seems to have a bit of a spike at the minute, so we would just uh, remind you to follow all the instructions given by the office bearers while you're attending uh, church, and, and we do appreciate you following the advice thus far. We also want to welcome very much this morning the Reverend Fred Greenfield along. He's no stranger to us in Tandragee. We've had him here many times, both preaching and singing, and we've thoroughly enjoyed his ministry, and we're delighted today that he can come uh, and preach at both meetings while Reverend Gray is still on holiday. Do remember the evening drive-in gospel service tonight at 6.30. And again, the Reverend Greenfield will be here to preach, and Melanie Ray will be along to sing. Tuesday at 8 uh, is the midweek meeting. This week, um, our assistant, Mr. Glenn Wilkinson, uh, will be along to take the meeting, our midweek meeting at 8 o'clock on Tuesday. Next Lord's Day, our morning service here in the church at 11.30 a.m., and our own minister, Reverend Gray, will be back again uh, in the pulpit. The drive-in gospel meeting um, next week at 6.30 and the Reverend Gray will be preaching, and Kirsten McMullen will be along to sing. A wee quick reminder just about some of the important dates moving forward. Um, Youth Fellowship uh, at 8 o'clock on Friday night, so please remember that, young people. Uh, meetings will recommence in the church hall, so that's for all our young people. Uh, Youth Fellowship at Friday, uh, 8 p.m. on Friday. Sunday School and Bible classes will recommence two weeks from today. 
on Sunday the 20th of September. It will be open Sunday school. Uh, please let Mervyn know as soon as possible uh, if there are any new children that are intending uh, to start. So please, parents, children, remember Sunday school and Bible class two weeks from today. All other meetings are being kept under constant review by the session, and we feel it is safe and prudent to do so. Then, an announcement we made with regard to restart dates for some of our other meetings. All meetings are subject to change, dependent upon government advice and changing circumstances. So please bear with us. And as I said at the start, thank you for all your help thus far with seating and so on. Can I ask you please to remember a couple of people in prayer? Um, the Reverend David Gordon is in hospital, uh, on well at this time. Um, and please remember to pray for the Reverend Gordon and his wife and family at this particular time. Uh, also, Mrs. Jean Topley has been quite unwell for a period of time now, so please, if you could remember uh, John and Jean and the family circle as well, uh, these folk, along with many others, need our prayers at this particular time. These are all of the announcements. I hand back to the Reverend Greenfield. Thank our brother once again for those words of welcome. Could ask you if you have your Bible with you, if you turn with me, please, for our scripture reading to the first epistle of Peter, First Peter, and to the second chapter, please. First Peter, chapter two. Perhaps we could take up our reading from verse eleven. The Word of God says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation." Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the King. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow His steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Amen. May the Lord bless to us the reading of His own inspired and His infallible Word. Let's just have another wee word of prayer as we turn to the preaching of God's Word. Our Father and our God, we thank Thee today for the Word of God. We thank Thee, Lord, that the entrance of Thy Word giveth light. We thank Thee that it giveth understanding to the simple. And Lord, Thou hast declared in Thy Word, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, 
who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And our Father, we ask Thee that Thou wouldst bless us today, strengthen us, encourage us, edify us, and grant, Lord, that even as we leave the house of God today, we may be enabled to say, it was good to be here, for here we have met with Thee. Bless us now, Lord, as we wait on in Thy presence, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, this is a wonderful chapter from God's Word in Second Peter, or in First Peter chapter 2. And I always think about it, especially the opening verse. It says, Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy, hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. And this chapter is precious to me. One reason is that way back in the 21st of February in 1965, in the old Ravenhill Free Presbyterian Church, that was the chapter from which Dr. Paisley preached on the night I was saved. I can't remember much about what he preached about uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, but I do remember that during the course of his message, he quoted that verse of Scripture, "'My spirit shall not always strive with man.'" And it was that verse of Scripture that he quoted uh, on a number of times that really convicted me of my sin. As a young fellow, being brought up in a Christian home and hearing the gospel and knowing all about the way of salvation, yet still unsaved, I began to think to myself, what would happen to me if God should stop speaking, if God would stop striving in my heart? And uh, many, many years later, I was conducting a mission up in Antrim, and there's a dear brother there who attended the old Ravenhill Free Presbyterian Church, and I was giving my testimony, and he said to me, give me that date again. And then he came back the next night because he kept a diary of everything Dr. Paisley preached, and he looked up the diary way back to 1965, and he was able to tell me the subject that Dr. Paisley was preaching on. But it's a beautiful chapter, and it says there, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word of God, that ye might grow thereby. I love verse 7. It says, unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. And isn't it a wonderful thing that this morning as we, we come together to worship God, because Christ is precious in our heart and life. And we're so thankful that we are saved by the grace of God. You notice verse 9, another wonderful verse of Scripture. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. My, we are a chosen generation. God has made us. He says we were, one time we were not a people, but verse 10 says, we are now the people of God, and we have obtained mercy. And then he says in verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. The old hymn writer says, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We're only strangers and pilgrims but we're like Abraham, we're looking for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. But I want to draw your attention to the final verses from verse 21 through to the end of the chapter. It says there in verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow His steps. And I want for a moment or two uh, today just to think with you, first of all, about the steps of the Savior. How beautiful to follow, the hymn writer says, in the steps of the Savior, walking in the light, walking in the light. And when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, we remember that there in glory itself, 
the Lord Jesus Christ stepped, as it were, out of eternity into time. He stepped out of the place of honor and blessing where the heavenly host would cry unto him, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And he would take that great step of humiliation, and in his incarnation he would come into this world and take upon himself a body like unto our bodies, and be fashioned and humble even as a man. And he would live in hardship and face great hostility that he might go to the cross of Calvary. The Bible reminds us that Solomon sat upon an ivory throne. And I love the words of that old gospel hymn that speaks about the Lord Jesus. And it says, Out of the ivory palaces and into a world of woe, only His great eternal love could make my Savior go. And when we think of the words here of the Apostle Peter, that ye should follow his steps. As Peter writes to the people of God, he's encouraging them to strengthen them. He's telling them they have to be subject to the powers that be. He's telling them about their Christian conduct and how they ought to live for the Savior. And he says to them, it's no profit if you suffer because you're evildoers or you do something wrong, but if you suffer for Christ and you suffer as a Christian and you take it patiently, then it is acceptable unto God. But he says, remember, follow the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. The wee children's chorus says, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask to be like Him, all through life's journey from earth to glory, all I ask to be like Him, to be more like Him. As the apostle says, to be, to be conformed to the image of His Son. When we think about the Lord Jesus and we would follow His steps, we realize that as he came into this world, his steps, as it were, led him outside, for there was no room for him in the inn in Bethlehem. When we read about the churches in the book of Revelation, uh, we are told there that Christ was on the outside. And in Revelation 3 and 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. He's outside, even as it were, of his own church. And through his life, there were times when people came to him and he wrought miracles and they heard the, the wonderful words that he spake, and they, they witnessed his deeds. But you remember the Lord Jesus said on one occasion to those who would follow him, he says, the, the, the foxes of the air have holes, and the, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not anywhere to lay his head. He, he, was, uh, uh, he went out into the desert place. He went out into the wilderness, and there he prayed. The steps led him outside, led him by the riverside. Remember that wonderful day when he came to John the Baptist, and John said, Lord, I, I need to be baptized of thee. But Jesus said, suffer to fulfill all righteousness. I, I want you to baptize me, John. And when the Savior was there, and he went down into the water, uh, and the Father's voice cried out from heaven, that this is my beloved Son, and the blessed Spirit of God descended as the, the form of a dove upon him. And that wonderful blessing there in the river Jordan would we hear the Father's voice and the Spirit in the form of a dove and the Savior Himself, God and the Trinity of His sacred persons. And steps led Him by the rivers, led Him by the, the wayside. There was a book came out many years ago, and it, it was called The Christ of the Human Road. And our Savior, as He walked by the wayside in this world. As I have said, he, he healed the sick. He opened the eyes of the blind. He made the lame to walk. He uh, gave strength to the palsied. 
He raised the very dead to life. He went with Jairus. He went to his home. He raised that little girl of 12 years of age who had died. He, he raised her to life. And he was at the grave site. And his friend Lazarus died. And as many Bible preachers and commentators have said, when Jesus went that day and he stood at the tomb of Lazarus and he cried, Lazarus, come forth! If he hadn't have named Lazarus by name, all the dead would have come forth. He is God. And then, of course, he was on the hillside. You know, I have had the privilege of being in the land of Israel on two occasions. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. And many times when a, a trip is advertised to the land of Israel or to the Holy Land, people say, walk where Jesus walked. And that's a wonderful thing to see that land and to see the, the, the places and to, to walk by the shores of the Sea of Galilee or to go out on the, the little boat on the Sea of Galilee or, or to go there by the hillside and remember the Lord Jesus Christ went into the, the hillside there and he, he sat down and as a teacher he, he taught that wonderful sermon on the mount. And we think too, how he went up into the mountainside. Do you remember there in the book of the Acts of the Apostles in Acts chapter 1, the Bible reminds us there that the Lord Jesus Christ, it says in verse 9, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up on a cloud, received him out of their sight. And as the Savior was there on the Mount of Olives, and he ascended up into heaven, and the angels of God appeared and they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And even in these days in which we are living, peculiar times, unprecedented times, people talk about them, and there's wars, and there's rumors of wars, and there's natural disasters, and there are earthquakes, and there are things that are happening in places that they never happened before in history, and there are famines and pestilences, and there is fear in the hearts of men and women. We realize that this same Jesus, the one who has ascended into glory, well, as the old hymn says, it must be the breaking of the day. It's almost time for the Lord to come. There's a great mystery. We know not the day nor the hour, but there's a great certainty for the Son of Man is coming back again. And friend, there's a great necessity that men and women are right with God. So Peter, in what we might describe here as a, a, a beautiful pen portrait of Christ. He, he speaks about the steps of the Savior. And then you notice there in verse 21, he speaks about the sinlessness of our Savior, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Thank God today we serve a sinless Savior. We serve the, the sinless, the harmless, the spotless, the crimeless, the flawless Christ of God, the one who was born into this world. The Bible says a virgin would conceive and bear a son, and they would call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. And our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into this world. He was born as none other were born. Every other person born into this world was born in sin and shaped and iniquity, stained and uh, sinful because of the fall of our first parents in Eden's garden. But He is virgin-born, sinless, 
And in that life, that sinless life, he came to the end. He poured out his soul unto death. And the Bible says, wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Jesus could say that the God of this world, Satan, Prince, he could come, but Jesus says, he hath nothing in me. You know, when we read those words, we're convicted. And we realize if the old devil were to come, the accuser of the brethren, the one who accuses the brethren day and night, my, he would find plenty in my life, plenty in your life. But he could find nothing in Christ. You remember Pilate, the Roman governor? He said, I find no fault in him. The dying thief, he looked to Jesus for salvation, for mercy, for grace. He found it. But when his other companion, the other thief who died, he said to that thief, he said, Dost not thou fear God? For thou art in the same condemnation. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Pilate's wife said, Pilate, I have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. The old centurion who over uh, saw the, 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 the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ when he, when he heard the, the cries of the Savior on the cross, when he witnessed all the things that were happening, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. And this book, the Bible, reminds us from, from Genesis to Revelation, from what the theologians call the proto-evangel there in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman, the virgin-born Christ, the seed of the woman, would one day bruise the head of the serpent at Calvary's cross. And thank God, He is our sinless Savior. So Peter speaks about the steps of the Savior, and then he speaks about the sinlessness of the Savior. And then, of course, he speaks here about the sufferings of our Savior. In verse 23, when He was reviled, He reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 22, in verse 1, where we have that cry from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if you were to read right through Psalm 22, and is it a, a psalm all about the cross and the Savior on the cross, and you come to the end, uh, uh, it speaks about He hath done this. And if you were to translate those words from that language, the Hebrew language, and into the New Testament language, uh, it means it is finished. And when we think about the sufferings of Christ upon the cross, uh, uh, and those physical sufferings, and all the hardship, and all the, the, the buffeting and all the beating and the smiting and the plucking of the very hairs from his face and being whipped so that his, his back was like a plowed field. And he could say there prophetically, it's spoken of Christ in Lamentations 1 and 12, is there no suffering or no sorrow like unto my sorrow? And we think about all the, the pains he had to bear, as the hymn writer puts it. And the crown of thorns that they plaited and beat into his brow, and the, the, the spikes that went through his, his hands and his feet, and the agonies of the, the, the terrible death of crucifixion. We think of his physical, we think about what it was for Christ to be forsaken, the one who was the darling of the Father's bosom. The one who is the Father's well-beloved, and yet when He was made sin for us, 
God had to shroud the cross in blackness and darkness, for God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And as His Son took upon Him our sins, what an awful thing for our Savior to feel so forsaken and so alone. And those mental sufferings as men mocked him and they said, if, if you're Christ, come down from the cross. Maybe Elijah will have him, maybe he won't. And all those that passed by shut out the lip and they spoke their false accusations and their blasphemy against him. And we think of how he suffered physically and mentally and judicially. Because the Bible says here, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The apostle Paul writes, and he says, he who knew no sin was made sin for us. And Christ bore the, the wrath of God judicially in his body on the tree. Oh, well, did the, the prophet Isaiah say, all oh, we like sheep had, had gone astray and we had turned every one to his own way, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Isaiah said in chapter 52 and verse 14, again thinking of the physical sufferings of the Savior, as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. The Lord Jesus Christ, how he suffered. I remember not long after I was saved, it was a lovely hymn, and I think it was the old Sankey's hymn book that they used in the old Raven Hill Church. And my, it, it thrilled my heart, it, it drew me closer to the Lord every time they sang it, how greatly Jesus must have loved me. That was repeated, how greatly Jesus must have loved me to bear my sin in his body on the tree. And so Peter speaks about the steps of the Savior coming into the world, and he speaks about that the Savior was the sinless Savior, and that He is the suffering Savior, and He, he speaks even, he, is, he speaks about the silence of the Savior. Oh, well, did Isaiah, the, the prophet, say uh, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Peter says there was no sin in Christ, and when he was reviled, he reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself unto him that judgeth righteously. Oh, that's, that's hard to do, isn't it? If someone says something about you or reviles you or says something, oh, we, we want to put it right. We want to state our case and state our cause and put things right. The Savior bore all the false accusations and the mockery. And when he was reviled, he reviled not again. There used to be a lovely hymn. Singer sang it. He could have called 10,000 angels to the world and set them free. He could have called 10,000 angels but he died alone for you and me. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 26, he said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled? Oh, he could have called twelve legions of angels. He could have spoken a word and his tormentors would have been damned in the deepest hell for all eternity. But how then, Jesus said, would the Scriptures be fulfilled? He suffered it all, even in silence, that he might bring you and me salvation. 
because he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And then, just in closing, you'll notice there too, uh, Peter speaks about the sacrifice of the Savior. He reminds us who did no sin, neither was guy found in his mouth. It was a, a, a sinless sacrifice. And his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. It, it was a, a substitutionary sacrifice. It was a vicarious sacrifice. He took our sins. The night I was saved, Dr. Paisley took his Bible like this. He says, Fred, the Lord Jesus, the sinless one, he says, if this is your sin, he took your sin on his own body to the tree, and he paid for your sin at the cross of Calvary. And that once and for all sacrifice, that vicarious, that vital sacrifice, that sacrifice that was necessary to, to bring us salvation. Thank God was a victorious sacrifice. And we sing that lovely hymn, so particularly on the Easter Sunday morning, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. And he, he arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. Hallelujah! Christ arose, our Savior, the sacrificial Christ of God, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He's victorious. And that's why Peter can speak here about the salvation of the Savior. He says, For ye were as sheep, in verse 25, going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Thank God by his stripes we are healed. Just like the story Jesus told, the parable in Luke 15 about the man who had the hundred sheep and left the ninety-nine safe and went out into the wilderness to seek for the sheep that was lost. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. You know, I think about Peter and Harry writes, and he gives us portrait of Christ, but are fitting that Peter himself, he, he could tell us there in, in chapter 5 uh, and verse 1, he says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Peter says, I'm a witness. I witness the sufferings of Christ. And Peter, who at times was, was so quick to speak and uh, so quick to someone says to open his mouth and put his foot in it. He says in chapter 5 and verse 5, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. Peter had to take the humble place at times. But he says, Christ has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says, we're now returned to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Can I ask you just, as we bring our meeting to a close, do you know Christ as your own and personal Savior? Christ is called here the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. He's called the good shepherd who giveth his life for the sheep. He's called the great shepherd. But you know, the psalmist David said, the Lord is my shepherd. There may just be someone within the hearing of our voice and you don't know him. You can't say, Fred, I know. I have the assurance, I have the witness of God's Spirit with my spirit, that I'm born again, that the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I shall not want. Friend, we're your servant for Christ's sake. If we can be of any help to you, come and speak to us. May the Lord bless you. Our gracious God and our loving Father, we thank Thee afresh today for Calvary. For what our Savior accomplished for us on that old rugged cross. And how we thank Thee today that He rose again on the third day, triumphant over sin and death and hell and the grave, that He ever liveth to make intercession for us. And one day the skies are going to break, the trumpet will sound, and our Savior will come again in power. 
and in glory. Lord, we pray for each one by now in your presence. We pray for every home and for every family. The Lord, they might know the blessing of God that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow thereto. And should there be one still outside of Christ, Lord, that even this very day they may press in to the kingdom of God. They may seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Lord, separate us now with thy blessing. Take us all to our homes in safety and abide with us throughout this day. For we ask all these things in the Savior's name. Amen.